Good morning, everybody. Never has anything been complained about more, but laughed at harder than dad jokes. So I've told my kids, that, like, if you didn't laugh so hard, I'd quit doing it. But they complain like I've got some kind of a horrible problem, but then they laugh like all of you. As a matter of fact, some of you who I know for a fact saw that video already. You were still laughing like you needed one of our ushers to help you out just now. Some of you are looking at me like, not me, bro. If you're looking for someone who's cured, you found them. All right, well, the reason why we indulged in that bit of philosophy there is because we love our dads here at Cross Point. Being a dad is tough, and of course I'm looking for attention for myself. I've got five kids, and it's a tough thing, and we love you. Uh, we know that it's, a, that it's a responsibility. We know there's a lot of joy to it, but we know it's a challenge, and we just want you to know that I'm gonna beat the tar out of you with this sermon and tell you everything you're doing wrong, but after that, we love you. No. <laughs> we don't do that here because we love you, we support you, and we know that God has identified himself as a father, so it's pretty close to his heart, all right? So God bless you. Just know you're among friends this morning, and happy Father's Day to you, okay? What I am excited to do is get into our Game Changer uh, series. It's been great for me. Some of you guys seem like you're having the best time during the, pre during the preview video. That's when you guys are really cheering because you were there or something like that. Uh, but the sermon's not bad either, so I hope you're looking forward to that. Before we get into it, let's pray if you don't mind. Lord, thank you. Um, thank you that the gospel has been a game changer in our lives, that we didn't suddenly just become better. Instead, we heard good news from you. We've experienced your presence and you've brought so much peace and joy salvation and repentance into our lives and this has been the free gift of God not something that we accomplish so none of us have anything to brag about instead we can just praise you and thank you for who you are and Lord we know that your word is inspired by your Holy Spirit it's where we heard about you it's where the truth of God is contained and so we love it here at Cross Point we say the Bible is a book for us and it's what we're going to talk from today and so I pray that by the power of your Holy Spirit you would apply it to our hearts and help us to change. In Jesus' name, amen. There's a few advantages of being able to speak. There's a few disadvantages, too. How would you like to follow that video, for instance? But there are a few advantages when you get the opportunity to get up and speak, and here's one of them, is that if you ever do anything kind of cool in your otherwise mundane life, like mine, you get an opportunity to kind of brag about yourself without seeming like you're going to, okay? So that's why I'd like to take this opportunity right now to let you guys know that me and my older brother Josh and a friend of mine, Justin, we got the opportunity to hike the Grand Canyon this year, a couple weeks ago, and I just wanted you to know that, okay? So let's get into our sermon now. <laughs> no, I have a point here, and the point is this. Man, I love, there's a tame word for it. It's called people watching. Like, I love to just enjoy humanity and all of its zoo-like nature, you know, wherever I go. But I feel like people watching is too tame of a word, but I don't have a better one, okay? So I'm just going to go with it. I got to do some really great humanity-enjoying people watching at the Grand Canyon. And uh, I'd like to share just one aspect of that with you, if I could, to get into our sermon today. And it's this. So in our trip, we started out on what's called the South Rim, which should warn you already, Rim. But anyway, we started out on the South Rim and we hiked down 4,860 feet of elevation within 6.3 miles. So if you're like, I don't know about that stuff and I don't care, let me just put it this way, that's, you're going down fast. Like when you flush something, it might go down faster, but this is going down fast, okay? It's a long way to go down. And what you get to experience is you're up there on the top and you're just starting out in your journey. So you got all the strength in the world, you know? Your 33-pound pack is nothing to you right now because you're just getting going, you know? And you're fresh, you've had water, you slept in a real bed last night, and so all you have to do is go downhill. And the only thing you got eyes for is the scenery. It's the most incredible thing you've ever seen before, and you just can't understand why the park rangers keep warning the heck out of you about, what, about what's really gonna happen to you. And just like you always do, you just ignore them. Like, they're just crabs, you know? They live here, and they don't know, and they're not on vacation like I am, and so they don't know that I can handle this hike just fine. There might even have been a little bit of judgy disdain for the people who are making their way back up. 
Can you believe that? I mean, you're headed down fresh, you still feel good, you got plenty of water. When you see people struggling back up like they're escaping a zombie apocalypse and can't wait to get to the top, you might just kind of catch a side glance at them and go, well, maybe they didn't train as much as I did. <laughs> but now, the Grand Canyon knows about you. I'm just gonna put it that way. I've been to other national parks, and I've been to state parks. This national park knows about human beings, and I'm gonna tell you why. I have never been so warned in my life. When you sign up for a hike into the Grand Canyon, you get like a video that's basically like, don't do it. <laughs> and that's from our government. And then when you go there, there's like signs greeting you and they get extremely more strenuous the closer you get to the rim. And it's kind of like, hey, be careful. Hey, it's hot down there. Hey, unless you have no reason left to live, do not do this. This is what comes down. It gets a little crazy. You're like, all right, whatever. There is even, friends, there is a comic book panel. This is on a government paid for, agreed with warning sign, okay? There is on the sign, along with other strenuous warnings, which I didn't read, because why would I? I was on my way down. There is a comic book panel of a guy on his knees with a pack and his hands splayed out like this, and he's blowing chunks all over the front of him. That is on a sign, I'm telling you the truth. Is everybody okay? It won't get worse than blowing chunks, okay? That's, I'm not gonna say anything worse than that. There is even, this is to me was the best part, all right? There's a huge, there's probably a couple, but I'm just, I, we went down this room, so. There's a huge yellow triangle like highway warning sign, okay? And across the top it says, warning, with a, you know, exclamation mark. Going down is optional. That's what it says. Coming back up is not. <laughs> Dude, that's a t-shirt. That is a neck tattoo waiting to happen. <laughs> if you get one of those, I want you to come let me know. Why do they warn you so much at the Grand Canyon? I think this is why. They know that human beings have a tendency to think that we have a tendency to think we are somebody and that we can do some things and that we're gonna be fine whenever we are strong and feeling good and well supplied and heading downhill. But what do you guys think? If you just had to theorize, what do you think I learned about myself when I was headed back up? If anything, there's not enough signs. <laughs> you know, you're looking at the scenery before, you know what you're looking at now? Your feet. Because you're too scared to look up and see how much further you got to go. And your prayer life has never been better. <laughs> For every three steps, you're promising to never do it again. You know what I mean? Heck, you'll even, I'll give money to the church. I'll do literally anything if you get me to the top. Remember that water you were so sure you had plenty of? Now you're jiggling the bag. You're real worried. You're wondering what you're gonna do. You keep telling yourself it's a dry heat, which comes to mean when you're dead, your body will be pretty dry when they pull you out of there. You start to notice the helicopter that had to descend and pull a lady out while we were there. She's okay. I wouldn't have brought it up if it was, I think she twisted her ankle. Anyway, if anything, you start to think, why did those rangers let me do this? Here's why. The Bible has us diagnosed too, I think. It's one of the unique things about the Bible is that it says that human beings have an inner pride kind of a self-centered like pride that kind of deceives us a lot and is open to the suggestion that maybe we're headed down thousands of feet with all the world in front of us when maybe our situation might be more like we're, we need to head up thousands of feet and we don't have anything left. But the world, the flesh, the devil, they all stand by to flirt with us a little bit and prep our ego and get us thinking and confused about where we're at and what's really in front of us. As a matter of fact, I think this goes deeper than hiking. Have you ever noticed how amazingly annoying people can be when they have already been through something that's really hard that you're just at the beginning of or in the middle of? I'll give you an example. Whenever you're a parent and you talk to people who have already raised their kids and you're real desperate and not feeling good and needing some advice, 
It can be real annoying to talk to people who have been through it all already because you come up to them with your great ideas. This is was Kat, one of Catherine and I's ideas. So when we were younger, you know, sugar was just flowed like wine in the 80s and 90s, you know. You could have as much as you wanted. Man, my dad would say, get my money's worth whenever we went to Ryan's Buffet. It was like, dude, go through there and eat as much as you possibly can because it's on, you know. I want you to get my money's worth. Here's the sugar. Grandma was handing it out. So then, you know, sugar, eating food, became a big problem in my life. So Catherine and I agreed, like, hey, our kids are not doing that. Our kids are not eating a bunch of sugar. (laughs) And then you get these parents who've been through it all before, and you're sharing your philosophy with them. Our kids are not eating a lot of sugar, you know, and you're like this always when your kids are new. And they're not. They're at peace, and they put their arm around you and go, that's nice. That's Both of their pockets are loaded up with Werther's Originals. And if they thought you'd listen, you won't because you're too geared up at the time. But if they thought you'd listen, they'd pull them out and give them to me. You go, here, you're going to need this. You're just too dumb to know it right now. Your kids are going to eat plenty of sugar. You'll eat it, chew it, and put it in their mouth by the time you're done just to get them to leave you alone for a few minutes. (laughs) And man, if you want to get real into it, complaining about your marriage and all the hard things you're going through, it's... It's not the couple that's been married for 50 years you want to talk to, really, because they're going to annoy you by going, I know, man. No, no, you don't understand. She needs to, and I do this and this, and who, and me, and you. And they're like, I, I know, man, I know. No, I don't know. I need help. They're like, you need help, but you don't really know what kind of help you need right now. So just let me, let me, let me put an arm around you. Why don't you sit down? You feel like sitting down? You don't look too good. And you're like, what's up with these people? Here's what's up with them, I think. They came up the hill already. <laughs> They're eating a steak and camping out on the south rim because they're done now. And you thought you were cool on the way down, but now you're on the way up and you're all freaked out. (laughs) And they know that you couldn't figure it out on the way down because your pride was in your way. And to be honest with you, it gets a little bit more serious than this, in my opinion. The stakes get even higher than this, I think so. There's kind of a, and I know it doesn't always go this way, okay, but people who have had like a real, not a pretend, but a real brush with death, like maybe a serious heart attack. Maybe some of our guys that were wounded on battlefields. Maybe some that have gone bouts with cancer. Why do they come back? I understand not every time, but a lot of time, they come back way less worried about stuff than I am. Way more at peace with stuff. Way less confidence in their own ability to conquer the world. Why is that? You know what makes me nervous? I think it might be because there's things you can learn when you know you don't have what it takes that you can't learn when you're still fooling yourself into believing that you got this. And you know, that puts us back in the Bible's territory again because it's another unique part of the gospel where God has told the world, like John 3, 16 style, that God has so loved the world that he sent his son not to give us a pep talk, not to kind of wave at you, but to die to make a way that if you would put your trust in him, he'll lead you out of this mess. Because I think the world has a tendency to think they're on their way down the hill for a great trip, but I have a reason to believe that God knows we're at the bottom trying to make our way up, and he's come to help you, but you've got to realize where you're at. And if there's anything that stands in your way, pride, whatever, then that's our real problem, not the things that we think are such a big problem. So I just wanted these things in our mind as we read my game changer verse today, okay? So if you have a Bible with you, turn to Matthew chapter 11. We're gonna be in Matthew 11, 28 through 30 primarily today. And uh, if you didn't bring your Bible with you, that's gonna be up on the screens. But I'll give you just a second to turn there. Bam, there it is. All right, this is Jesus talking here, and it says this in 11 and 28. Come to me, all who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your souls, for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. If you've heard these verses a lot, you might be like me, so my mom, was Pentecostal, and I'll just put it lightly to say the Bible was a big part of our lives. 
And so I heard verses like this a lot, and you know what? I started to have a bad habit of thinking I was hearing them, but just kind of going over them real smooth. So I would love to just draw your attention again to all the things that God, because we're Christians, we believe that Jesus Christ was the Son of God, and that everything that he said and did, God would put his stamp on and say, that's what I would say and do, because he's my son, it's the face of God. Everything he says, I agree with. And what does God say about himself? Take my yoke upon me and learn from me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart. That's God talking. That's the creator of the universe talking. That's the one who made everything that you see, who has the power of life and death in his hands. He says that he's gentle and lowly in heart. Isn't that kind of amazing? What right do we have to believe? What right did we have to suspect that God was like that? I'm kind of amazed by that. As I read these verses, I wanted to say that it's a game changer to me that the gospel is an invitation. The gospel is an invitation. Did you hear that? Jesus says, come unto me, all you who are weary and heavy laden, and you will find rest. He's inviting you to something. He's waiting for you. Now, think about all the things that it could have been. You know, to be honest with you, in my human nature, I definitely wouldn't have made the gospel an invitation. That's just not like what I would think you'd need to fix the type of world we live in. It doesn't appeal to me, not immediately in my flesh. You mean to tell me I'm in such a big mess, but I'm being invited? What is this, a tea party? Instead, I'm tended to think that if the gospel was this life-changing force, then it would be something that I would understand more, like the gospel is a problem to be solved. You know, Jesus has died for you and has set the plate. Here's your tools. Get out there and get to work, and let's see what we can do for him with a picture of Jesus above it on the cross saying, hey, all this I've done for thee, what hast thou done for me? That just makes more sense to me, but I gotta be honest with you. As I've tried to make that kind of gospel work in my life, I always end up washing up on shore, defeated again. I went to work for God and came back empty-handed and weary and heavy laden again. Or a matter of fact, considering the depth, how deep religion is, how deep philosophy is, how deep spirituality can be, and amen, they are deep subjects. I would have thought then if the one who invented it all, the one who invented everything and is the spirit who created everything that you see, then if he was gonna share his central message with me, I wouldn't expect an invitation, I'd expect a mystery a deep mystery to be solved so I can get out my slide ruler and my fat books and get a PhD and get down to the bottom of it and finally figure it out. But do you know what happens to me? Every time I try to do that again, I come up more tired, weary, heavy laden and burdened than the last time and maybe even dumber than when I started, which is kind of frustrating to me to be honest with you. And I have a tendency sometimes to start to blame God for that. Isn't that kind of funny? While the whole time, He's standing by going, buddy, it is what it is. It's an invitation. You're invited. So then I have to slow down, and maybe you'll slow down with me right here today, and start thinking, there is a lot of power in invitation, though, isn't there? Invitation. Well, I think about it in a small way. It's like when I'm in the foyer, and my two youngest girls will run up to me, and you, some of you dads already know the one-two punch that's coming. Apparently, some of my girls' friends, their house is so much better than ours. <laughs> their food, so much tastier. A lot more sugar happening over at these other houses, apparently. I don't wanna name names, but I'm just saying. All oh, the movies they watch, so much better than maybe some dads who are raised Pentecostal think should be watched. And they want to go over to this person's house, and you wanna know what? I don't care. They're not going, <laughs> you know? Like, I wanna go. I wanna go, it's like, you wanna go? I wanna be a millionaire. You know, you pull out all the dad stuff. People in the desert want ice water. You know, I don't care. <laughs> and then they have the one, two. They say, I wanna go, and we've been invited. Oh! All of a sudden, I went from being a disciplined dad that's like, too bad you wanna go. You know, I don't care now, but they've been invited. Somebody wants my girls to be over at their house. And why wouldn't they? They're the best girls in the world. When they come over, they light the place up, so of course they want them over there. And all of a sudden, since they've been invited, it makes me feel like a good person and a good dad to say, sure, you can go over there. That's the power of an invitation. Doesn't it change your world a little bit whenever somebody says, hey, we're doing something over here. We're, some of us are going swimming. Now for me, no one ever accused me of being a social butterfly, okay? 
I'll let that sink in. Some of you are shocked and turning pale, and that's all right. But I personally love it when someone just says, we're doing something. I go, good for you, you know? Have fun, <laughs> you know, I'm going home. As long as it's just like, hey, something's happening. We're all going to a restaurant after church. Great, I'm sure they'll appreciate your business in these tough economy times, you know? I'm going home. But man, does it get tougher when they go, we would love it if you would come. All of a sudden, the invitation means there's an open heart behind this. This isn't something happening somewhere. This is someone who wants you to be there and to come. And listen, 80% of the time, I say no anyway. But I feel bad about it, you know? I'm actually affected as I go home and read a book anyway. <laughs> what right do we have to believe that lost as we are, mean and hateful to each other as we are, confused and ugly and full of death as we are, as rebellious and far from God as we are and have been, as confused and lost and left out as we are, what right did we have to believe that God has been expecting you, that you're not, God's not happening somewhere for some people, good for them if they know who they are, but what right did we have to believe that God has you in mind and that you're invited, that he has a space at his table for you, that he's made a place for you, Whenever you've been done something dumb to somebody and they're mad at you and you do what you do at first, which is blame it on them and try to find a way out of it and it's their fault somehow, I'm sure, but then you run out of energy on that and you realize, no, it's mostly your fault. You started it and they have every right to be mad at you and you start to make your plans like, okay, maybe if I go find them, I could make it up to them and apologize and if I do really good and promise not to ever mess up again, maybe I could find their way back in. How much does it take a load off of your heart? How good is it for you and how much mercy does it put into your life when instead they call you first and invite you and say, hey man, where you been? How come I haven't seen you in a while? I'll say, well, I thought you were mad at me. Oh, whatever. I love you. Come on over. I've been wondering where you were at. What right do we have to believe lost and unforgiven as we feel, distant from God as we feel, as bad as our culture has been? What right did we have to believe that that's what God did? He didn't wait for you to fix it and clean it up and come find him. He sent his son to find you and to ask you where you've been and to tell you that he made you for a reason and that he still wants you at home. What right did we have to believe that an invitation was coming our way? Provided that sounds like a pretty cool deal to you, and it sounds pretty cool to me, why in the world don't we take his invitation more often? What's wrong with us? Why do we always think we're gonna make it? How come we can't get it to our minds that we're headed down the south rim, not back up? Like, what's the problem with us? I'll tell you the problem with me, and something I've seen in our culture a lot, and the reason why I think Jesus worded his invitation the way he did is because he said, come unto me all you who are weary and heavy laden. And yeah, sometimes in moments of clarity, I realize that I'm weary and heavy laden, but you know what I do a lot of the time? Is I think I'm sure he's talking to other people, but I'm doing pretty good. I think I'll make it. As a matter of fact, if I could just get more supply and a few less haters, I could probably accomplish what I set out to do. And God just has to shake his head again and go, man, maybe tomorrow he'll know I'm talking to him. I think a lot of us in a culture where it seems like, you know what life is about? It's about getting out there and making it happen. You have to establish who you are. You gotta decide what your identity is and get your name out there and make something happen. Then Jesus' invitation can sometimes sound more like an interruption, to be honest with you. And when you go reading through the Gospels, that's what you'll find. Most of the people that rejected Jesus, it wasn't because they understood what he was saying and kind of disagreed with them. It's because they heard an invitation to quit. Like, hey, you're not making it, you're not doing well, religious leader, you're not leading anyone, you're blind guides and you're leading each other into a hole. Hey, person who trusts in money and wealth and reputation, it isn't gonna do well for you, the wages of sin or death, but the free gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus. Come on and take it. They're like, man, I'm not looking for a gift. I'm not looking for a handout. I'm not looking for a second chance. I'm not weary and heavily laden. I'm doing just fine myself. So I think one of the reasons why we so often don't take Jesus up on his invitation is because we forget he's talking to us. I'm weary, I'm heavy laden. I think a second reason why 
is that in our culture, we kind of teach people that if you're weary and heavy laden, that's your fault, man. You screwed it up somehow. And if you're the one who screwed it up, you better take care of it. And to be honest with you, as an American all my life, that kind of makes sense. Fix it yourself makes sense to me. It's the culture I was raised in. It's how our work. We are the wonder of the Western world because America works and we produce stuff. And if we make a mess, we attempt to clean it up ourselves. And so a lot of times we don't think God is talking to us. And it's why our, one of our real powerful gods in America that we turn to a lot in our lives, it's why it makes so much sense. That's why money makes so much sense in our culture. Now, I'm a preacher, and I just use the M word, so I know a lot of you are afraid I'm gonna go on a rant, and I'm not going to. Matter of fact, all I'm trying to say is, you have to agree, growing up in our culture, money makes a lot of sense. Like, if you have problems, you can solve so many of them if you just have enough money. I love a little cultural experiment that I have, so I own two suits. If you've ever seen me at a funeral or a wedding, you've seen one of the two, okay? So most of the time, I go up to the QT near my house in my T-shirt that has Godzilla playing a guitar on the front, and I've got my jeans with a coffee stain, you know what I mean? And they treat me just about like you would anybody else, you know, so it's all good. And then I love it, man. On the rare occasion when I need to go in for a pack of gum so I don't knock somebody out with coffee breath at the funeral I'm headed to, I will stop in at QT wearing a suit. Now, I don't want to overdo it. They don't dim the lights and roll out the red carpet for me. But do I, de do I de de detect a different tone of voice? Have I been called sir before when I go in when I'm wearing a suit? Yes, I have. Why? Because in our culture, if you can get enough of that, if you just look like you have some, then all of a sudden there's instant respect, which makes sense because you're one of the ones who's making it. You're the one of the ones who's getting it done. And it never seems to occur to us or matter that the ones who are at the rare top of the Alps of money keep trying to tell us from up there, Turn back, it's not what you think it is. You won't know who your real friends are. It'll destroy you. You won't know who you are. You won't know where you're at. Everyone will want a piece of you. It's horrible, turn back. We go, maybe it didn't work for you, but it's gonna work for me. Still heading on up there. And then as we roll down the slopes going, oh, what happened to me? We never seem to learn the lesson. As a matter of fact, in our culture, if you get mad that some people have money and you don't, you'll have friends. You can be mad about it. Be a hater. Just, ah, oh, man, I hate it. Money's everything. I don't have any. Ah, oh. you'll always have pals. You could get a bunch of it and be like, yes, money, it's good. Greed is good. We're into it. And you'll have friends. Your friends will know you really left the reservation and you're not coming back. If you start living a life that goes, you know what? Money's here sometimes. It's not here sometimes. But you know who's always been here for me? The one who has held out eternal life as a free gift to me. Do you know who's always been here for me? The creator of the universe who forgave me of my sin and adopted me into his family and is not looking for ways to get rid of me. Your friends will start avoiding you on Sunday morning when you're headed to the car because they know where you're going. You know why? Because you have been invited into everything that money pretends to do for you but never seems to get done, not in a way that lasts. And it doesn't turn you for it or against it. It just gets you away from it. And your friends know you've answered an invitation that makes you a very different person than you are. So this is what I think. We need to learn, weary and heavy laden, God is trying to wake you up and he's not waking you up with a task or a puzzle. He's waking you up with an invitation. Okay, preacher. I've heard this type of stuff before. Let's say I even agree with you. What is it Jesus is inviting me to? You say I find rest for my soul, but listen, man, I'd love to put on a white robe and go lay on a hill and wait for the second coming or whatever it is you're selling up there, but Monday morning, I've gotta go to work. I've got stuff to do. I don't know what this rest is. I know you're kind of saying I could stop all this striving and stuff like that, but what then, what am I gonna do? Is this just another Jesus hippie moment where if I just realize some things, everything would be okay and I'll float my way to heaven? No. The only way we could get that in our minds is if we ignore the rest of the verse. He says, come unto me, all you are weary, heavy laden, you'll find rest for your souls. But then what does he say? Let's read it again. Labor and heavy laden, I'll give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you'll find rest for your souls, for my yoke is easy, my burden is light. Now for some of you who have been wondering why Jesus wants to take the yellow part of the egg and put it on you, First, I take every opportunity to let God take the yellow part of the egg and put it on me, brother. 
I, well, anyway, uh, but I'm not talking about that. I'm actually talking about a yoke, and I've got a flattering picture of, there we are, us and our coworker. Now look at this thing. This is a yoke, just so happens to be attached to some oxen here, although, I, let's be honest, I don't know what they are. I was raised in an apartment and then down in Arnold. <laughs> but I do know from my research that that crossbar across the two of them and then the wooden collar causes their work to happen together side by side so that what one does, the other does too. So that when they pull together, they accomplish so much more work. Now listen, Jesus hasn't called you into laying on the ground and just waiting for it all to happen. So much better than that, so much wilder than that. He's invited you into a working relationship with him. He wants to pull with you. Now listen, I could even imagine a universe where God says, welcome in. You finally got smart enough to take me up on it. Here's your leash. You put it on and I'll keep a hold of you. No, he doesn't say that. I could imagine, definitely imagine a universe where he goes, hey, you finally took me up on it. You're forgiven. There's the penalty box. Get comfortable. That would make sense to me. Or I could see one of those dog carriers. You guys know what those are? The box you put a dog or a cat in because you got to travel with them. You know what's a funny part that I like to see happen like at airports and stuff like this? So you got your real big dog lover and they open the cage and they feel bad because they got to put their dog in a box, you know? So they're feeling bad about it and they're big dog lovers. So they first, they try to invite the dog in like their dog's dumb and doesn't know it's a box that's about ready to close on them. So they're like, get in, Poochie, you know? Mommy loves you, please get in the box. Like throw a treat in there. They're like, yeah, you threw me treats before, but not into a prison cell. I'm not going in there. So then finally they look around, make sure none of their dog lover friends are watching, and they put them in. They're like, we have to get to Florida. Get in there. Sorry, Poochie, I'll apologize later. Anyway, God isn't trying to stuff you in a box like that. He's not throwing you a treat in there. He's invited you to stand shoulder to shoulder with him, to learn from him, and to accomplish things with him for all of eternity, you have to admit, it's a pretty good offer for just realizing you were worn out before and it was your fault. Matter of fact, go up to verse 25 with me real quick. Does this guy know what time it is? Does he know it's Father's Day and we got barbecue? I do. <laughs> go up to verse 25 with me and we'll get this over together. <laughs> At that time, Jesus declared, I thank you, Father, Lord of heaven and earth, that you have hidden these things from the wise and understanding and revealed them to little children. It's another little thing for you to think about. So are you weary and heavy laden? No, I'm fine. Okay, well, Jesus isn't talking to you today, but maybe tomorrow you'll realize. Again, here he says, he's, he's hidden these things from the wise and understanding. You know better? You wise and understanding? You wanna stand eye to eye with God and say, hey, I'm still working with it. If you got a deal, we could talk. God says, no, it's not really like that, but I'll see you tomorrow. But if you wanna be like a child who says, I don't know what I'm doing, man, I'm lost. <laughs> I couldn't find my way out in a million years. I need help. Some of the, my best ideas have gotten me in trouble, and some of the things I thought were really going to work out destroyed my life and other people's, and I need help. I don't have any reason to expect help, but I need it, and I'm lost, and I need you. Then God says, oh, good, because I've been looking for you. I want to show you something. Verse 26 says, yes, Father, for such was your gracious will. All things have been handed over to me by my Father, and no one knows the Son except the Father, and no one knows the Father except the Son, and anyone to whom he chooses to reveal him. And right after that, Jesus says, so come unto me, all you who are weary and heavy laden. Just when it was starting to sound like a quiz you had to answer. No one will show me the Father. Well, what do I gotta do to see him? Jesus says, all you gotta be is tired. Just like my servant Josiah, who found himself addicted to meth, without friends and without hope in this world, who one day decided to just walk out of his Hoosier apartment off of Miller Road and say, God, I can't do this anymore. I'm completely lost. I have no idea how to get out of it. And God said, I am so glad, man. I have invited you and I've been waiting to have this talk with you. And ever since then, I have had nothing from him except a hand to lift me up when I mess up, encouragement, a new family in my life, and eternal life. That's a pretty good deal for just finally realizing I was an idiot and needed his help. All right. There's two ways that I think we could hear this this morning. There's maybe three. The third one would be, I'm so glad he's done and I want to go, but you guys aren't thinking that. So we don't need that one. <laughs> the other one would be this. If you're sitting here thinking, you know, 
all my life when I've heard about Christianity, and maybe I've been around other Christians, it seemed to me that it was more like, if you become a Christian, it's because you're good, like you, you're good now, you're not bad and naughty, and because of that, you get to join a club called Christianity where God's your friend, and you get to be just a little, not a lot, but just a little bit better than other people. And you can wear sweatshirts that say, what can I pray for you, you know, and make other people feel bad about themselves. And because of that, I've never really wanted to have any part of it. But what you're saying today doesn't really sound like that. And I want to say that's because that has nothing to do with Christianity. <laughs> it is not now, nor has it ever been, a little social club for people who think they're a little better than other people. It would take someone like the devil to be able to lie so much that he could make a religion based on the fact that God had to come down, send his son, and pay the penalty for the things that his people that he loves so much has done for them. And that what he wants from them is to stop all of their bragging and feeling cool about themselves for once and humble themselves and come to him so that he could be reunited with him. It would take a devil to lie to you about that. And that's what I'm telling you this morning. That's what I'd like for you to think through. Not because I'm telling you to, but I would just say, hey, take a look around at the culture around you. Think about the life that you've been in so far. What if this whole time you've been invited and someone who hates you and wanted to give you your paycheck of death at the end of your life has tried to keep you from understanding that you, yes you, have been invited simply because you're worn out, heavy laden, and you need rest for your soul and you don't know how to get it out of yourself. What if that's true? I say it is, and I'm asking you to consider it. Now the second one that I think could be hearing me today that would be me, I follow Christ, I've given my lifetime, I took him up on the invitation, but so many times in my life, I've wandered off, forgot that it was an invitation, started to think that it was like a co-production between me and God, like he was producing the movie, but I'm starring in it, and then all of a sudden I start trying to negotiate with him and do a little bit of what I want, and then kind of like mix it with a little bit of what he wants, and then he has to go, hey buddy, come on now, we talked about this. So if you're here today and you go, man, Josiah, I remember, I remember when it was like an invitation and yes, and a party and I'm forgiven, but man, man, have I wandered away from that. I would say to you is if it started with an invitation, you know it gets back that way just the same way, don't you? He's still the same God that invited you in the first place. Why not come back home and go, hey, I'm still the big dummy I used to be. I need help. Let me out. He'd be like, obviously, obviously, I love you. I'm a good father. What do you think I was looking to do, kick you out of the family? No. He's not like that. Why would he be when he's invited us in, in his son? Is that enough? That's enough. Let's be done. What do you say? Let's pray. Father, I thank you for this unlooked for, unexpected, and unearned invitation. It's been a game changer in my life. Come unto me, all you who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. So Lord, I pray for any of my friends this morning who did not know you were like this. They didn't realize they were invited. I pray that now in their heart, in their own mind, they would know. They're invited. They have to deal with it as they will, but I pray they would see. They're not condemned. They're not ignored. They're invited. They're forgiven. They're seen. And I pray that that would be so obvious. And for those of us who follow you, God, I pray, bring us back to that time when we took your yoke upon us and learned from you and found you gentle and lowly in heart. What a beautiful thing. And I just pray for all those at Cross Point who call Cross Point home that we will just be in a yoke with Jesus Christ and not out trying to solve it ourselves or bargaining with you. And I thank you for these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. All right, now listen, before you go grab your pork steak, if you want to know how to take a next step at this church, we actually have a room that's literally called Next Steps. You go out in the foyer, you want to talk to somebody, just do it. They'd be willing to talk with you. If you want to take a next step with God, same room, pretty bright of us to do that, wasn't it? So if you want to move forward with God, you go in that Next Step room, they'll have you. For the rest of you, I find it hard to believe, but I've heard that every one of you is going to be here Wednesday night, which is going to make it pretty crowded, Pastor David, but I'm into it, so I'll be seeing every single one of you Wednesday night. God bless you. Happy Father's Day.